Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. In today's video, I'm going to introduce swaps. So I will discuss the mechanics of swaps, the different types of swaps, and we will look at how we will value swaps. Although we will be covering or we will uh, introduce uh, different types of swaps, but we will mainly focus on interest rate swaps and currency swaps. So swaps are uh, the third type of uh, derivatives under the forward commitments. So remember in forward commitments, we learned about three types uh, of uh, derivatives, uh, which includes futures, forwards, and swaps. Now, swaps are an over-the-counter derivative. Uh, in this contract or in this agreement, uh, two parties exchange uh, cash flows at uh, certain times in the future, a specified time, according to a certain specified rule. So unlike the case of forwards or futures where the exchange between the two parties take place once, in swaps, the, the exchange will take place more than once. So swaps provide a, a way to hedge a stream of risky uh, cash flows while in forwards or futures they provide a mean to hedge uh, a single uh, a risky payment or a single cash flow and in, in the in general there are different types of swaps but the uh, most common types of swaps include uh, the following so there are interest rate swaps and uh, under interest rate swaps there are swaps that uh, uh, between uh, fixed rates uh, to variable rates and there are swaps that uh, exchange variable rates to a fixed rate and there are also swaps in which uh, the exchanges between a variable rate to another variable rate. Um, also, there are currency rate swaps or cur uh, exchange rate swaps or currency swaps. And there are commodity swaps. There are also equity swaps. And there are also swaps that are uh, considered credit derivatives, such as the credit default swaps. So, we will, as I said at the beginning, we will focus uh, on interest rate swaps and currency swaps. So let's look at what are these major types of swaps, and we will also touch base on the other uh, uh, other tube swaps, just to give you an overview uh, um, about these types. Now, an interest in interest uh, rate swaps, uh, it is used by companies and or investors to swap or uh, to modify their interest rate exposure so if for example uh, a company that has a loan that is based on a variable rate and this company expects interest rates will increase so to hedge this exposure they will swap this variable rate loan or they will enter a swap in which they will receive the variable rate and they will pay a fixed rate so this way they converted their exposure from being based on a variable rate to be um, to be based on a fixed rate now in, in any interest rate swap it has to be based on a notional principle so there, there should be determined a notional principle in the swap because we are dealing with interest rates. So we, uh, and when, when you are dealing with interest rates, the rates by themselves are not exchanged. Payments based on these rates are really what are exchanged. So to determine how much will be the interest payment, we need to determine, okay, if that's the rate, uh, it is calculated based on what? So it is calculated like for example 3% 3% of what it is calculated based on 3% of a notional principle that has to be determined in the swap 
We also need to familiarize ourselves with some important terminologies, which includes the swap term or the swap uh, tenure. And they refer to the life of the swap. So uh, if the life uh, of the swap term is for three years, it means that the swap will last for three years. And in each year, it depends on how many payments there are. So, but what what matters is that this swap will end after uh, three years. Now, commodity swaps are also uh, popular, uh, although seventy percent seventy percent of the swaps are uh, in the OTC market are usually are interest rate swaps. The commodity swaps are not as uh, hugely uh, or uh, uh, largely uh, uh, traded or engaged in, but still it is uh, available and many companies uh, use them. In fact, uh, some companies uh, like oil and gas companies, they enter into uh, swaps to hedge their exposure to the oil and gas prices. So they, uh, one of the instrument, popular instruments that they um, uh, uh, enter into to uh, hedge their exposure to uh, uh, these prices is to enter into a commodity swap. Now, how does the commodity swap work? It, we can consider a series of forward contracts uh, on a commodity. So we know that in a forward contract there will be at a certain uh, at the delivery date or at the maturity of the contract there will be an exchange between the short and the long now in a commodity swap it is similar to the forward contract however it differs is uh, the diff major difference is that the exchange will take place at more than more than one time however the 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 delivery price will be the same so, for example, a company entered into a delivery, uh, a commodity swap for two years. Uh, an exchange will take place every six months, and the price, let's say, uh, for wheat is five dollars per bushel. So, every six months, there will be an exchange between the uh, between the uh, uh, the short and the long um, at the predetermined price and the predetermined uh, quantity. Now, swap, uh, commodity swaps in particular could be settled physically or financially. So, in a uh, let's look at a physical, uh, physical, uh, physical settlement example. Uh, assume that we are dealing with an industrial producer, let's uh, call IP Inc., that needs to buy 100 bar barrels of oil one year from today and also two years from today. So IP Inc. agreed with a counterparty to pay 110.483 for each barrel of oil. So in a physical settlement, uh, after one year, the oil buyer uh, or IP Inc. will pay 110.487 and receive a, a barrel of oil. So that's, is, that is an example of a physical settlement. So there will be an actual exchange of the uh, oil and the, 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 the same amount uh, or the amount agreed on or the commodity, the commodity swap price will be paid. Uh, in a financial settlement of the swap, uh, the swap parties will look at the difference between the spot price and the swap price, which is 110.483. So they will see the spot minus 110.483. If the difference is negative, then AP Inc. will pay to the swap counterparty this difference and then buy oil from the spot price, uh, uh, at the spot price. Okay. Now, if the if the difference is positive, then the swap counterparty pays IP Inc. and also 
IP Inc. will go and buy oil from the spot market. So we will notice that the difference uh, or the need for uh, IP Inc. is always going to be 110.483. The difference between the financial and the physical settlement is that in the physical, uh, the actual delivery of oil and payment of the swap price will be will take place in a financial settlement they will compare the price uh, the swap price with the spot price in the market and then there will be payment from one party to another and the actual buying or selling uh, will take place with another uh, with another uh, with another party. Now, uh, the third type of derivative uh, swap is the equity swap. In an equity swap, uh, one party pays the return on an equity and the other party pays a fixed or floating or a return on another equity. So one 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 example one uh, one example of a equity swap, a swap of the six months return on the S and P five hundred for the six months uh, LIBOR uh, LIBOR rate. So since the return is paid, it is uh, possible that the payment could be negative, which means one party will pay to the other instead of receiving payment. Now uh, payment. Uh, or in this type of swaps, payments are not determined until the end of the period. So they have to wait until the time for payment that takes place and they will look at the rates and then there will be a payment uh, between um, uh, from one party to another. Uh, what is left is a currency swap and we will discuss a currency swap in, in uh, the other part of the uh, class. Let's look in detail at the interest rate swap. So here we will be examining what's called a plain vanilla interest rate swap. Let's assume that Apple uh, entered into a, an, uh, an agreement to receive a six months LIBOR and pay a fixed rate of 3% uh, per annum uh, every six months for three years with a notional principle of 100. Now, one thing we have to keep uh, uh, pay attention to and keep in mind is that the 3% here, since payments are made semi-annually, this is not an effective rate. This is an APR. So we have to, uh, to uh, calculate the actual payment that takes place every six months. We have to divide this by two, multiply it by 100 million, then we will determine the fixed payment. And the same applies also on the uh, floating uh, payment. So it, it, always it's better to organize the uh, uh, swap uh, into uh, a table so we will make sure that you understand uh, when each payment is going to take place and what will be the payment at each point in time. So we have the, what will be the LIBOR rate. So the only unknown to us in an interest rate swap is what? Is it the fixed rate? No, the fixed rate is, is already determined. Is it the timing of the payments? No, the timing of the payments are also determined. So the only unknown is the flow rate or the LIBOR rate in our case. So once we know what is the LIBOR rate, we can determine what will be the floating cash flow. And we will also determine what will be net cash flow. In our case here, Apple will receive the LIBOR and pay the fixed. So uh, the net cash flow determined is based on uh, receiving floating and paying fixed in this case. Uh, let's assume today Apple signed the swap 
uh, on March 8, 2016, and they that, and they looked at the market. What is the swap? What sorry? What is the LIBOR rate today? And they found that it's 2.2 percent. So, at the time the swap is signed, both parties, the long and the short, they know what will be the net cash flow. Why? Because the payment that will take place six months from now is based on the LIBOR rate we observe today. So there is a lag between when the payment takes place and when the LIBOR rate is set or determined. So here we see that in September 8, the floating rate, since it's a 2.2, which means that the uh, effective LIBOR rate will be 1.1 times 100 million will be 1.1 million. And the fixed is based on 3% semi-annually, which means every six months there will be a fixed rate payment of 1.5% times 100 million, we will get 1.5 million. So we'll, uh, Apple will receive 1.1 and pay 1.5. So net, it will make a payment of 400,000 or 0.4 million. Now, is there any uncertainty when the two parties signed the swap contract about what will be the net cash flow, the first net cash flow? No, this is known at the time they signed because both parties know what is the swap uh, on March 8. Now, on September 8, the LIBOR rate will be set. So for the next payment that will take place March 8, 2017, now we know what will be the floating rate, and then we will know what is the net cash flow. We observe, okay, so on March 8, do we know what will be the payment on uh, March 8, 2017? No, because we don't know what LIBOR uh, will be on September 8. Once we reach September 8, 2016, we, uh, we look at what will be the LIBOR rate and we will set it, so we will fix it for the next payment. So in the next payment also, uh, the, uh, since the LIBOR is 2.4, which means the floating cash flow will be this divided by two times 100 million, and we will get 1.4 million. The fixed cash flow is the same, will not change. And the net Apple will pay 100,000 or 0 0.1 million. So the process will continue. On March 8, 2017, uh, we will observe what is the what is the LIBOR rate, which is 3.3, .3, and the process will continue until the last uh, date in the swap, which is March 8, 2019. So we, we will observe, starting from the third payment, Apple will receive cash. In the first two payments, it was paying cash. And in the uh, last four payments, it's receiving cash, which means that their expectation of the direction of the interest rate was correct and they benefited from uh, this swap. Okay, what are the typical uses of interest rate swaps? A typical use is to convert a liability from a fixed rate to a floating rate or the opposite, you convert a liability from a floating rate to a fixed rate. Uh, also, that's not only limited to liabilities, people can enter into swaps to convert an investment. So they can convert an investment from being based on a fixed rate to a floating rate and from being based on a floating rate to be, uh, uh, to be based on a fixed rate. Let's look at these types in, in more detail. In the previous example, Apple, let's assume that Apple signed the swap with Citibank. So in, in, in this swap, Apple 
will receive LIBOR and will pay the fixed. Why would Apple enter into such an agreement with Citi? Now let's assume that Apple had a loan with another bank that is based on LIBOR plus 1%. Now, after entering into the swap, what will be the effective interest rate that Apple will pay? To do this, we will we have to add the, the payments that Apple will make and we will deduct from it the uh, uh, payments that Apple will receive. So the net cash flow or the net interest payment for Apple will equal to LIBOR plus 0.1% since it's paying this to its lenders and it is also paying this uh, paying 3% in the uh, swap to a uh, city and it's going to receive LIBOR from city so minus LIBOR Now, what will be the net? Well, LIBOR minus LIBOR will cancel each other. So what is left is 3.1%. I want you to reflect on this. What makes Apple enter into this uh, uh, swap? Does Apple believe that the LIBOR rate will increase in the future or it will decrease? Now, what will happen if LIBOR increased and, and uh, Apple did not enter into the swap? The interest expenses for Apple that it will pay will become higher. Now, the effect of entering into the swap for Apple is that it will make the interest payments fixed to 3.1. So if, it's, if Apple's prediction was correct, and indeed LIBOR rates increased then Apple benefited from this swap by fixing the rate so no, no matter how high the LIBOR will increase they will always pay only 3.1 percent <clears throat> let's look at the uh, another exa a, a different example here Intel entered with Citibank in a swap where it will pay LIBOR and receive a fixed amount of uh, interest payment. Why would Intel enter into such an, a swap? Let's assume that Intel had a, a bond issuance in which it pays 3.2% and <clears throat> Apple doesn't want it, it, its interest payments to be fixed so it, it, it entered into this swap with city now after entering into the swap how much will be the net interest expense that Intel will pay so to determine this we will sum the payments that Apple uh, sorry Intel is paying and we will deduct from it the interest that Apple is uh, Intel is receiving so net here is uh, 3.2% minus uh, sorry uh, first it's paying 3.2 and since in the swap it is paying uh, the uh, floating lake or the floating uh, part of the swap which is the LIBOR minus <clears throat> it is receiving 2.97 minus 2.97 so net um, Intel will pay LIBOR plus um, yes uh, plus 0 0.23 percent now what makes Intel 
enter into this swap what is Intel's expectation about the direction of interest rates in particular the direction of LIBOR in the future does Intel believe LIBOR will increase or it will decrease before entering into the swap it pays 3.2 percent after entering into the swap, it's paying LIBOR plus 0.23 percent or LIBOR plus 23 basis points. Of course, yes. Now, the only reason that makes Intel enter into the swap is that it believes that the LIBOR will decrease and if LIBOR decreased, it will pay a lower interest expense so as a company any company they want to lower their expenses and increase their revenues since uh, if, if Intel believes LIBOR will decrease then it's in its interest to have exposure to LIBOR so it will pay a lower interest expense compared to 3.2% We notice uh, here that City acts as an intermediary between Apple and Intel. So for City, it's going to receive the LIBOR from Intel and it's going to pay the LIBOR to Apple. So City does not have any exposure to the variable interest rate or, or to the LIBOR. And City will receive 3% from Apple and will pay 2.97% to Intel. So it's keeping in its account uh, three basis points as a profit from entering into the swap or uh, managing the swap. Now, sitting here is acting as a swap dealer. And the swap dealer usually quotes the, inter the fixed interest that it, uh, it, um, it receives and the fixed interest interest that it pays uh, because in in the in the in in, in um, this kind of swaps city will receive the variable and pay the variable so uh, the variable is already known uh, what will be negotiated is the fixed rate that it will pay or it will receive now there's three basis points here could be the swap spread for city now we will see later if we go here that the swap spread could vary uh, depending on what is the maturity of the swap so in uh, a two-year three-year swap the uh, swap or the difference between the bid and the offer is three basis points now the swap rate here if we take into account the time value and um, the uh, when each payment is going to take place we will get an average of 2.565 uh, and uh, that's for the two year and the same for the three years and so on Now, we, we learned earlier that we can enter into a swap not only to transform liabilities, but also we can enter to transform assets. Let's look at this example here. Riyadh Bank had, an, uh, let's say, a portfolio of bonds uh, that pays 2.7. And Riyadh Bank believes that interest rates will go up. So it wants to have an exposure to the variable rate instead of just receiving the fixed rate of 2.7. So it agreed with JP Morgan to enter into a swap where it will receive LIBOR and it will pay 3%. So how much will be the net interest that uh, Riyadh Bank will receive? Let's look. So net, we will add together interest that uh, Riyadh Bank will receive and then we will subtract the interest that Riyadh Bank will pay. 
receive 2.7 percent plus the LIBOR minus the percent it will pay to JP Morgan so net uh, receive LIBOR minus 0 0.3 or 30 basis points <coughs> so if LIBOR increased the amount of interest that Riyadh Bank will receive will also increase and however if uh, Riyadh Bank expectation was not correct and interest rate decreased then the amount of interest they will receive will decrease but Riyadh Bank entered into this swap only because it has a strong belief that the LIBOR will increase otherwise there is no point to uh, uh, for Riyadh Bank to enter into the swap on the other hand Sam Bahir has a portfolio of loans that pays a LIBOR minus 0.2 percent now Unlike Riyadh Bank, Sam believes that interest rates will go down. So it wants to protect its uh, revenue by fixing the amount of interest that it will receive. So it in a swap, it will pay to JP Morgan a LIBOR and receive 2.97%. So net, how much Samba will receive? Let's look. So it will receive LIBOR minus 0.2% and it will receive 2.97% but it will pay LIBOR so we did, did a LIBOR we will get a net so LIBOR will cancel with the LIBOR and 2.79% minus 0.2% so net we will have 2.77% so if Samba's expectation was correct and the LIBOR rate really decreased then they protected their revenue from decreasing by receiving a net of 2.77% okay um, one of important point that we have to keep in mind is that when we are dealing in in in, in reality in, in the uh, in the financial industry they don't simplify life by stating that n is always equal to uh, for example if it was six uh, months so it's not by 12 have 0 0.5 that doesn't work the way it works in the industry is that uh, it depends also on in where you are dealing with and which market you are uh, dealing with but if we are in the US and uh, we are dealing in a money market uh, where uh, LIBOR is the difference rate usually to calculate the uh, period N we uh, uh, count the number of days between two dates between the, the two uh, payments and then we divide by 360 now in some other money markets they divide by the actual in some other uh, markets they divide by 365 so you have to keep in mind what is the day count convention now uh, in the previous example the payments took place uh, uh, in the swap where Apple was uh, uh, part in, 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 in it was receiving the variable and pay the fixed the pay dates in which uh, payments take place was March 8 and September 8 so if you want to determine what is N 
we need to count how many days between March 8 and September 8. So in March, we know that there are 31 days. And since the contract was signed on March 8, so for March, we will consider only uh, 31 minus 8. That will give us uh, 23 days. In April, we know that there are 30 days. In May, we know that there are 31 days. In June, we know that there are 30 days. In July, we know that there are 31 days. In August, there are 31. And in September, we count from the first day until uh, September uh, one day before September 8 so we will have seven days so we have in total uh, here 150 170 and uh, 170 and 180 and 184 uh, sorry 83 183 so to calculate the payment, we need to know what's the relevant floating rate uh, times the notional principal times N, which is 183 that we found, divided by 360, and we will get what will be the floating uh, rate cash flow. The same process apply also on the fixed rate cash flow. And then we take the difference between the floating and the fixed. And if it is positive, uh, the party will receive pay a payment. If it is negative, then the party will pay a, a payment. We next turn to uh, the issue of why does a swap market exist in the first place? Why, for example, if Apple wanted to borrow in a fixed rate or in a floating rate, and it has the the other type of debt, why it doesn't just borrow from the market where it wants and repay the market that it wants to avoid? So, uh, in our example, Apple wanted uh, borrowed from a market uh, from the floating rate market and it wants to convert its debt to be based on a fixed rate why can't apple just borrow from the fixed rate market like bonds issuing bonds or or notes <clears throat> and use it to repay its uh, floating rate debt which is usually is based on bank loans so why why it why it doesn't go uh, directly to the market where it's starting and enter into a swap <clears throat> to understand the motive behind uh, or why, uh, why does a swap market exist let's see the following example here in which we have two companies we have a double a corp which wants borrow from so that's important we keep in mind it, 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 it wants to borrow floating and a triple B corp which wants to borrow fixed and <clears throat> both triple A and triple B went to the market to the fixed rate market and the floating rate market they were quoted with the rates that we observe in the table so it, it is obvious that triple A a higher credit quality than triple B and we observe that in the fixed rate market it triple A will pay 4% and in the floating rate it will pay the line minus 0.1% triple B will pay in the fixed rate market 5.2 and it will pay in the floating rate market a LIBOR plus 0.6% or plus 60 basis points 
Now, <clears throat> to understand why does a swap market exist, we need to look at the difference between triple A and triple B in, in both markets. So the difference between triple B and triple A in the fixed is 1.2%. And the difference between triple uh, A and triple B in floating rate market, it's 0.7%. Which means that the difference between the two companies or the spread between the two companies is not the same. And this is what motivates the existence of the swap market. Why? Now, here, in the fixed rate market, we observe that the difference between AAA and B is the largest. So we can say that AAA has a comparative advantage because in both markets, AAA always pay a lower rate. However, in the fixed rate market, it pays a more less rate. So in Arabic, it pays أكثر أقل triple A تدفع أقل في الفكست وفي الفلوتيك لكن في الفكست تدفع أكثر أقل okay طيب in the floating rate market uh, we observe that the difference is lower uh, between or the spread is lower between triple A and triple B so we can say that Triple B has a comparative advantage in the floating rate market. Why we, we said this? Because triple B always pay higher rate than triple A in the fixed and the floating. However, the difference is lower in the floating rate market. We can express it in another way. Triple B pays always more than triple A. However, it pays less more in the floating rate market. Again, in Arabic, triple B تدفع أكثر في الحالتين fixed وفي floating. لكن تدفع أقل أكثر في floating rate. So that we will say triple A has a comparative advantage in the fixed. Triple B has a comparative advantage in the floating. What does this mean or how <coughs> this help us <coughs> to design the swap? Well, each company will go and borrow from the market when it has a comparative advantage. And then they will enter into a swap. So after the swap, they will have the exposure they are targeting. So triple A will borrow from the market where it has a comparative advantage, which, which is the fixed rate market. And triple B will borrow from the market where it has a comparative advantage, which is the floating rate market. And then they will enter into a swap where uh, the net for triple A will be a floating rate and the net for triple B will be a fixed rate. Uh, how we will design this, we have to keep in mind what's the difference between the two, uh, the two companies uh, or what's the difference between the the spreads and the fricks and the flowing? So the difference between the spreads, so 1.2 minus 0 0.5, we will have 0.5% or 50 basis points. Now, we have to design the swap in a way where each company will realize a reduction in borrowing cost that is at least 20 face, uh, 25 basis points compared to uh, the rate they will uh, pay if they win directly and borrowed from the floating or the fixed rate market.
again we want to compare what will be the net effect after entering, after entering into the swap and relative to the case when AAA go and borrow directly from the LIBOR market or the floating rate market and triple B will go and borrow directly from the fixed rate market the swap when we design it must uh, now the benefit of the swap for both companies is as I said five zero point five percent uh zero zero point five yeah zero point five percent which is 50 basis points we have to divide them equally between the two companies so each company will realize a reduction of 25 basis points now there are unlimited ways in which we can uh, design the swap one is that we design it in a way to make triple a pay LIBOR and we want the result for triple a is that it will pay LIBOR minus 0.35 percent uh, for triple B we want the net that triple B will pay is 4.95 percent from where did I get these numbers what is a 25 basis point reduction uh, in the floating rate market for triple b so deduct 25 basis points so for uh triple uh, for uh, so here yes we are looking at the wrong one for for uh for triple a uh 25 basis points minus or libor minus 0 0.1 percent minus 25 basis point will will result in like minus one percent minus 0 0.25 percent we will get that after entering into the swap triple a will pay minus 0 0.35 base percent and for triple b <coughs> 4.2 percent minus 25 basis points so we'll receive will achieve 4.95 percent <clears throat> so is this what will be the net for both companies after again to the swap well let's look at apple uh, sorry at the triple a for triple a it pays so knit it pays four percent and it pays life receives four point thirty five percent so net we LIBOR minus 0.5% for three, what will be the net we will get how much it will receive pay. so it will pay LIBOR plus 0.6% and it will pay 4.35% and it will receive LIBOR so net LIBOR will cancel with the LIBOR and net uh, will be will pay 4.35% now compare this with what is triple a offered in the fixed rate market 
uh, floating rate market sorry it will pay in the floating rate minus one percent and as a result of interest swap they achieved a lower uh, interest cost or a lower rate so there is advantage of by uh, in entering into the uh, into the swap for triple a how about triple b in triple b in triple b the company point fixed and if we, it went and borrowed directly from the fixed rate market it will pay 5.2 after entering into the swap the company ended up paying a lower interest which is 4.95 so that's why the uh, there is uh, there's an advantage for both companies that motivates them to enter into the swap market and achieve a lower interest uh, interest rate or be charged a lower interest rate. Now, sometimes or usually, not sometimes, usually, the transaction is done through an intermediary, financial institution. The financial institution will act as a broker between triple a and triple b <clears throat> and to manage the swap it will require a certain amount uh, uh, a certain a certain uh, a certain number of basis points as fees to uh, manage the swap so we observe here that triple a and triple b borrowed from their the market where they have a competitive advantage and the financial institution is receiving LIBOR from AAA and paying LIBOR to B, but it's receiving 4.37 and it's paying 4.33. So we can notice that there is a four basis points fees that <clears throat> triple, uh, that the financial institution is keeping as a profit for itself. And when we are designing the swap we have to keep in mind how much the financial institution requires as uh, fees to manage the swap or to broker the swap so if there is a financial intermediary we have to deduct the four percent from the 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 total benefit of the swap so in this case the total benefit of, of the swap is 50 basis points we deduct from it four basis points so what is left for both companies is 46 if we divide divide them equally between the two companies then each one will realize a reduction relative to what they are offered in the market of 23 basis points after taking the uh, fees of the financial institution fees Now some people will say these rates are available in the markets and for both uh, companies so there is really no need to enter into the uh, the swap uh, and and, and uh, uh, the differences in the spreads are just something that are uh, artificial well that's not true why that's not true because lenders in both markets they will take into account the risk associated with the the borrower they are dealing with so we know that triple a is the highest credit quality so there is there is almost it is almost impossible that for triple a to default at least in the near future however triple b is not a high credit quality and it has a higher probability of default now, if triple B went to the fixed rate market, the lenders will keep in mind that triple B has a higher probability of being in default. So they will charge a higher interest, or even they will charge a higher spread compared to the floating rate because in the floating rate market, lenders can sometimes recall the loan if the uh, if the 
risk increase or there was a default event with the borrower and also they can reset or they uh, they can change the spread over the LIBOR uh, if they feel that the credit quality of the borrower is deteriorating. Lenders in the floating rate market, usually the banks, they have the ability to review on a, on a, on a frequently basis the uh, status of the borrower and if they felt that there are a decrease in the quality, credit quality of the borrower, they might uh, change the spread over the LIBOR. So uh, because they have this flexibility, they will not charge a higher spread uh, compared to the fixed rate market between triple A and triple B. Okay. Now, next we turn to the issue of valuing an interest rate swap. Now, an interest rate swap, since it's also a derivative contract, at the time when the party signed this contract, it has a value that was uh, worth zero, or very close to zero. But as the time passes, and as the conditions in the market changes, this contract could have a positive value and it could have a negative value. How can we approach uh, an interest rate swap? First, we need to think of an interest rate swap as a portfolio of an FRAs, forward rate agreements. And we learned that to value a forward rate agreement, we need to estimate what will be the interest rate in the future when the uh, when it's time for the FRA to settle. The same applies on swaps. So let's assume we are dealing with a two-year swap where payment take place every six months. Uh, for We are looking at the swap for the party that pays fixed and receive a LIBOR. Now, assume that the fixed is 5%, so every six months the uh, company or the party will pay 2.5. and it will receive LIBOR and today we observe at time zero we observe that LIBOR is 4.5 percent which means it will uh, receive 2.25 percent <clears throat> We learned at the beginning that for the first payment, since we are today, uh, we observe the LIBOR, there is no uncertainty about it. If, let's say, three months passed, okay, uh, we still know what will be the next payment because it was set three months ago. The problem co comes from what? Comes from the next payment at uh, year one and at year 1.5 and at year two why because to determine the payment at year one i need to know what is the libor six from now from from now six months from now and i don't know what we cannot predict we we don't see what will what is libor six months from now we see libor today we don't know what will be LIBOR tomorrow. So how we will be able to determine what will be LIBOR six months from now. And the same applies for the payment that will take, take place after 1.5 years. We don't know what is LIBOR after one, point, after one year from now. 
So we need to know what is the LIBOR one year from now to determine what, be, what will be the net cash flow 1.5 years from now on this, or in the third payment. Next in the last payment. To determine the last payment, we need to know what is LIBOR at year 1.5 be able to determine what will be the net cash flow now if we are facing with this problem okay what should we do we will follow the same process we did for if phrase we will rely on the concept of forward rates to find what will be the forward LIBOR rate and assume that the forward LIBOR rate will be the rate we should observe at each point in time and based on the forward LIBOR rate, we will uh, uh, and what will be the net cash flow. Okay. Uh, now, one important point that we have to remember when we are dealing with these rates, and the frequency of compounding is extremely crucial. Why? Remember the rule I mentioned before. The frequency of compounding must match the frequency of payments. If the rates I'm given are continuously compounded and payments are taking place here, uh, as in the example here, every six months, I cannot use the continuously compounded rate to find what will be the net cash flow. I have to convert it into a semi-annually compounded and then I can determine what will be the net cash flow. So, if I want to determine the floating, the, the forward rate, how, should, how, how can we proceed? If I want to determine the, float, the forward LIBOR rate from 0 0.5 to 1 year, okay, or I want R, or the forward, forward rate that starts from 0 0.5 to year 1, I need the LIBOR, the six months LIBOR from now until six months, and I need the one year LIBOR. If I have this and I have this, I have two options. First, I assume that the frequency of compounding are semi annual because the swap here payments are made semi annually. Now, if you are not sure, Okay, like in an exam, ask. Okay. <clears throat> Second, if the rates are not uh, semi-annually compounded, let's say they are uh, continuously compounded, then I can use the formula that we learned in chapter four to find the continuously compounded rate, which is, oh, just a second, please. F R from 0 0.5 to 1 is equal to <clears throat> R2 which is 0 uh, which is 1 year times T2 which is 1 uh, minus R1 times T1 divided by T2 minus T1 <clears throat> Remember, I only can use this formula if the inputs are continuously compounded. If the inputs are not continuously compounded, either I convert it into continuously compounded rate, find the forward rate, and then I convert it back into semi-annually compounded rate, or I will use the other formula to find the forward rate, which as we learned is 1 plus R from time 0 to time 0 0.5 sorry from time 0 yes to 0 0.5 times 1 plus r from time 0 0.5 to 1 is equal to 1 plus r from 0 to 1 so I solve for this 
and I will then have the discrete or semi-annually compounded forward rate that I can use to determine the net cash flow. So the only headache we are face when we are dealing with volume gas swap is to determine what are the forward rates. Once we are done with this, then the rest is just a mechanical calculation and we will find the, the, the value of the swap. <clears throat> so the procedure to find the value of an interest rate swap is to calculate the LIBOR forward rates and then we calculate the swap cash flows that will occur if the LIBOR forward rate are realized we uh, and then so uh, which means we will calculate what will be the fixed what will be cash flow and what's the variable cash flow and we take the net between them and then we will discount these swap cash flows at the uh, OIS in the past when they used to use the LIBOR as a discount rate it was much easier to find the value of an interest rate swap because we can consider the swap as a combination of two bonds one that is continuous and one that is based on a floating rate so uh, to discount the floating rate bond it is much easier than uh, the fixed rate and then we take the difference between the two and that will be the value of the swap but since now in the industry people are moving away from using LIBOR as a proxy for the risk free rate and you're using more and more the OIS then uh, we will follow this practice and we will uh, differentiate between the floating cash flows and the rate at which we use to discount the swap cash flows <clears throat> so let's take an example we are dealing here with a swap that involves paying 3% per annum and receiving LIBOR every six months on a notional principle of 100 million the swap has 15 months remaining uh, which means that there will be an exchange three months from now nine months from now and 15 months from now why because payments are made every six months the LIBOR applicable to the exchange in three months was determined three months ago remember timing between each payment is six months so if we are here and there are three months uh, there are three months from now time zero it means that the rate was determined three months ago this way we will have a six months period between the time the rate was set and the time the payment will take place or the time between the, uh, the last payment and the time between the next payment now what else we have we have that the forward LIBOR rates for the period from now uh, sorry from three to nine months is already given to us and for the period from nine to fifteen months it's also given to us <clears throat> which are 3.4 and 3.7 both are continuously compounded and this is an important trick that you have to pay attention to since they are continuously compounded I cannot use them directly to calculate the net cash flow I cannot use them to calculate the floating cash flow why because the frequency of compounding must match the frequency of payments since rates are here continuously compounded I have to convert them into a, a semi-annually compounded then I will be able to calculate the floating cash flow. <clears throat> the uh, uh, example also tells us that the OIS zero rate for maturity three and nine and fifteen months. So, if I want to discount for three months, it's two point eight. If I want to discount for nine months, then the discount rate is three point two, 
And if I want to discount for uh, 15 months, then I will use a 3.4% because the term structure of interest rates are, uh, it's not flat. It is uh, positively sloped, which means it's the higher the maturity, the higher b that uh, we will observe the rate will be. Let's look at the calculations. One now, one way to do the calculations is to construct a table. We will determine what are the floating cash flows, what are the fixed cash flows, what the next cash flows, uh, net sorry cash flows, and what will be the present value of these cash flows. <clears throat> Before we proceed, remember that we have to convert the forward LIBOR rates from continuous into uh, semi-annually compounded so to find rm we will apply the formula that we learned in chapter 4 which states that m times a to the power of r c the continuous rate divided by m minus 1 will give us the semi-annually compounded rate and also this rate is an apr so not use it directly, we have to divide it by two to get the effective semi annual rate. <clears throat> so, since m is equal to two because we are dealing with semi annual payments, and e times uh, to the power of 0 0.034 divided by two minus one will give me. 0.03429% which means the actual payment will be 100 million times this rate times a half and we will get the floating first floating uh, sorry the second floating cash flow why did we use the first cash flow uh, first floating cash flow as 1.45 because if we go back here they told us that the LIBOR applicable to exchange three months ago was determined three months ago applicable to exchange three months from now uh, was determined three months ago was 2.5 so <clears throat> since it was the LIBOR that we found directly from the market and it was a, a six months LIBOR so we can safely assume that this is an APR with semi-annual compounding so to find the floating cash flow for the first payment we multiply 2.9 times a half times 100 million and we will get 1.45 million which means that net cash flow is going to be 0 0.05 we discount <coughs> using the uh, the OIS for three months and we will get the present value for the first payment in the swap is 0 0.497 or 49,700. The second payment, as I said, is based on the continuous, the semi annually compounded forward rate for the period from three months to nine months. And if you multiply the rate, times 100 million times a half we will get 1.7145 which means the net cash flow is 0 0.2145 we find what is the discount rate or discount factor and we will get the present value of 0 0.2094 if we also looked at the third uh, or the forward rate from period of nine months to a period of 1.5 uh, or 15 months uh, was uh, the the continuous compounded rate was 3.7 percent so the equivalent semi-annually compounded rate is 3.734 percent so to determine this payment the last payment the, the last floating payment in the swap we multiply this times 100 million times a half and we will get the second 
the last floating cash flow so the net will be the difference between the floating and the fixed and we get net is equal to 0 0.37 million uh, if we calculate the present value using the rate we observed uh, for the uh, 15 months OIS we will get 0 0.35 uh, 3519 now the value of the swap as we learned in, in this course that the process of valuing any type of project or contract or cash flows is that we estimate what will be the future cash flows we determine what is the appropriate rate and then we discount them using this rate and then we sum the present values and we will get the value and here is, is not an exception so to find the value of the swap we sum the present value of the net cash flows and we get 0.5117 million so the value of the swap is 0.5117 million or 511,700 so never ever write that the value is only 0.5117 you have to write 0.5117 million or write it as a whole number which is 511,700 now an important application <clears throat> that we can rely on uh, using the valuation of swaps is that we can estimate or uh, what will be a LIBOR rate for a certain uh, for a certain period so we will also here re, uh, use the concept of uh, or the technique of bootstrapping to estimate what will be the forward LIBOR rate given a certain set of information that we know today so what do we have here we have a swap that has a tenure of two years and the swap is for uh, an exchange of a fixed rate of 5% uh, with the LIBOR and since payments are made every six months we rely on the six months LIBOR rate now the these rates are semi-annually compounded so it means we don't have to do any adjustments other than dividing by two because the frequency of compounding matches the frequency of payments so why do we divide by two again because these rates are APR so to get the effective semi-annual rate we have to divide by two what else do we have we have that the forward LIBOR for months from 6 to 12 and from 12 to 18 months have been already calculated for us and they are 5 and 5.5 percent and we have the uh, LIBOR rate current LIBOR rates 4 percent so we can determine what will be the floating cash flows for the first three payments what is left is the floating cash flow for the last payment which we don't have any information so far about it now and we also have that the 6 and 12 and 18 and 40, uh, 24 months OIS rates are as given 3.8, 4.3, 4.6 and 4.75 so I organized everything here in this time our target is to find what is the LIBOR, uh, forward LIBOR rate for the period from 18 months to 24 months now how can we get this remember that the value of the swap is equal to what let's call this this cash flow here number one 
and this cash flow number two and this cash flow number three and this cash flow number four so that each cash flow that takes place in each point in time we refer to it by this number so the swap value is basically the print value of number one and plus present value number two plus present value of the cash flow number three plus the present value of the cash flow number four now can i calculate the present value of cash flow number one well i have the floating rate which is four percent i have the fixed rate which is five percent i know the notional uh, is uh, uh, let's say 100 million I know the payments are made semi-annually, so I can uh, uh, divide each by two. So I can I can calculate the first cash flow, and then I can find its present value using the OIS. So for the first one, I'm good. How about the second one? I also have the floating cash flow. I have the fixed cash flow. I have the uh, uh, discount pro the uh, appropriate discount rate and the same for the third one how about the last one the last one is the problem where because i don't have the floating cash flow uh the floating sorry i cannot calculate the floating cash flow because i don't have the uh, estimated forward for the libor now i know at the time the swap is initiated at the beginning of the swap the val its value is equal to zero so i will use this information zero is equal to present value number one present value number two present value number three and present value number four if i know these three then i can find the fourth one right if i can calculate the present value for the first second and third payments I take it to the other side then whatever the sum of these three after moving it to the other side is equal to the present value of number four for to get the present value for number four i have the discount rate i have the floating rate i know that the rates have has to be divided by two so i can get what will be the forward rate for the period from 18 months to 24 months so here we do the calculations so for the first uh, exchange the 0 0.5 because we uh, we have to convert them from being effective uh, APR to effective uh, semi-annual so the floating minus the fixed times 100 million face value uh, sorry the notional amount times the discount rate we get the present value of the first cash flow uh, since the present since the uh, floating is equal to the fixed then the th second cash flow has a present value of zero and the third cash flow we find its value following the same process so the total value of the three payments is equal to minus 0 0.2475 now we take it to the other side and make it equal to the present value of the fourth payment so we will get the fourth present value of the fourth payment is equal to 0 0.2573 again why did we change the sign because we took all the sum of these three we took it to the other side and made it equal to the present value of the fourth cash flow so 0 0.5 times 
uh, now what is the only unknown for us it's the forward rate for the period from 18 to 24 and we know that the present value of the fourth cash flow is 0 0.5 times floating minus fixed times the notional times the discount factor and we will get the present value so we solve for f and we will get f is equal to 5.56 percent so this is an application of how we can use the swap even when it's initiated today to estimate what will be the forward LIBOR for some time in the future okay next we will move into the uh, fourth type of swaps which is a currency swap now there are three major types of currency swaps and uh, that includes um, a fixed to fixed currency swap so it is similar to uh, borrowing uh, uh, borrowing um, based on a fixed rate from one currency and also borrowing from based on a fixed rate on another currency uh, and there is a, a fixed for floating currency swap uh, which is uh, which is similar to a borrowing based on a floating rate in one currency and borrowing based on a fixed rate in another currency and finally there is a floating for floating uh, currency swap and it is similar to borrowing uh, based on a floating rate uh, on both currencies now there are major difference between a currency swap and an interest rate swap and we will see this in a bit let's take an example of a fixed for fixed currency swap we have here British Petroleum and Barclays they agreed to enter into uh, a currency swap so Barclays will take from British Petroleum 100 uh, uh, sorry uh, 10,000 uh, 10 million sterling pounds and pays interest based on this amount and British Petroleum will take from Barclays 15 million dollars and paying 3% on th uh, on this amount so how the uh, payments in the swap will look like it will look like the following so uh, at the time they signed the contract and we are looking at this from the perspective of a British Petroleum it received 50 million then it's going to pay each year a 3% base on 3% uh, th on the 50 million so the first payment second payment until the last payment in which it will pay the interest and it also going to pay the principal it borrowed which is 50 million in return it's going to give to Barclays 10 million sterling pounds and receive an interest payment of 0 0.4 million until the last uh, in, uh, until the last payment where it will receive uh, 10 million plus the interest so an important distinction between interest rate swaps and currency swaps is that in an interest rate swap the principal is not exchanged there is no point of exchanging the principal because the principal is the same but in a currency swap the principal is different and there will be an exchange of the principal at the time they signed the, 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 the swap and then there will be a return of the principal when they uh, when the swap ends so at the, at, um, at the end of the swap tenure both uh, 
both, both parties in the swap will pay back the principal plus the interest. What are the typical uses of currency swap? Well, people, people can use a swap to convert a liability from one currency into a, uh, uh, into a liability in another currency, and they also can convert an investment uh, in one currency to an investment in another currency. Uh, again, one might ask, well, wh well why uh, does the currency swap exist? Well, the comparative ar ad advantage argument that we discussed in the previous uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the lecture applies here, and it could be even uh, uh, much realistic to expect that there will be uh, differences in the spreads, and that it would be due to the differences in the tax uh, rates applied to foreign country, uh, foreign companies, and, and 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 local companies. Let's assume that we observe General Electric and Qantas. General Electric wants to borrow uh for an it ex expansion in australia it and it wants to borrow in australian dollar Qantas wants to start a new project in uh, the us and it wants to borrow in the us now let's look at the spread between ge and Qantas in each currency so in the we observe here that ge always pay a lower rate compared to Qantas. However, the spread in the US is 2% and the spread in Australia is 0.4%. So it is obvious that the spread is not the same, which means that there are a comparative advantage for each Co uh, company in a, in, a, in a certain market. Where is the comparative advantage for General Electric? Well, applying the same logic we, we did before, now GE pays always less than Qantas in US dollar or in, or in Australian dollar. But the difference in USD is higher so we will say that GE has a comparative advantage in the US. On the other hand, Qantas has a comparative advantage in Australian dollar. Why did we say this? Because Qantas always pay a higher rate relative to GE. However, the difference is less more in the AUD, which is 0.4. So Qantas has a competitive advantage in the Australian dollar. <clears throat> now we want to design a swap that distribute the, uh, the, the, the benefit of the uh, swap between the two companies equally. So what's the total benefit of the swap for the two companies? Companies, it will be a, a total reduction of borrowing cost by 1.6%. Let's assume that the financial institution that will be the intermediary between GE, GE and Qantas requires 20 basis points uh, as fees to uh, run uh, or uh, to manage the swap, which means we have to deduct 1.6 minus the 2%. So what is left is 1.4%, which means the swap has to be designed in a way that each company will realize a reduction of 70 basis points 
or 0.7% compared to what they are offered in the market. How can we design the swap? Well, there are also unlimited ways to design the swap. However, here we have to pay attention. Now, <clears throat> the starting point is that we will make each company borrow from the market where it has a comparative advantage. So GE will borrow in US dollars and Qantas will borrow in Australia, from Australia. Okay? Now, one way to design the swap is that we make the uh, both Qantas and GE will... Uh, uh, we make them avoid having any exposure to the currency in which they borrow or to the currency risk. So to do this, the financial institution will pay to Qantas 8% and Qantas will pay to their lenders. And in return, Qantas will pay 6.3. From where did we get 6.3? Well, if we take the 7% uh, minus the 0 0.7 or the min minus 0. Point, uh, uh, minus uh, 70 basis points Qantas will achieve a reduction of bo uh, uh, um, Qantas borrowing cost will be 6.3 so <clears throat> that would, should be the amount that Qantas will pay as an interest how about GE? GE borrowed from the US so it should receive from the financial institution 5% so to receive 5% they, they pay it to the uh, lenders and it will pay 6.9 to the financial institution now if we did this what will be the net cost for both Qantas and GE well, 8% will cancel with the 8%. So the net is 6.3. Compare it to the what's available to them in the market, which is 7%. So they achieved or they realized a reduction in borrowing cost because of the swap. How about a GE? A GE received 5% US dollars. Uh, and pays 5% in US dollars and it will pay 6.9 now this 6.9 compared to what's available in the market uh, which is 7.6 so again they achieved uh, uh, a reduction in the borrowing cost which equals to 70 basis points so there was a benefit for the swap for both Qantas and the uh, GE <clears throat> now an important question here according to the dis this design of the swap who bears the foreign exchange risk is it Qantas is it GE or it's the financial institution now Qantas is going to use the fund it borrowed uh, in, in the US so it will pay interest based on whatever fun amount it generates from the project uh, so it, it receives um, from the project US dollars it will pay interest in US dollars so it doesn't have any uh, exposure to the uh, foreign exchange risk <clears throat> GE is going to implement a project in Australia so that project will generate fund it will use part of this fund to pay uh, the interest so also GE is not exposed to the interest rate interest rate risk uh, foreign exchange risk the financial institution will receive in Australian dollar AUD it will receive 6.9 and pay 8 so net in Australian dollar is <coughs> 1.1 percent in US dollar it's going to receive 6.3 and 
uh, sorry, 5%. To pay, uh, sorry, you know, it's going to receive 6.3 and going to pay 5%. So, net it will realize 1.3. Now, the difference between the two rates is what 2%, 0 0.2% or 20 basis points, which what the financial institution require. However, because it pays in a certain currency and receives in another currency then the financial institution here is exposed to the foreign currency risk now one of these three parties must be exposed to the foreign currency risk the way we design it here is that the financial institution is the party that bears the foreign currency risk now we can design it in a way in which the financial institution will not bear the foreign currency risk so it will receive in this design 6.9 pay 6.9 receive 5.2 us usd and pay 5 percent usd so net it will receive 20 basis points in usd with no foreign currency exposure but who will who will uh, face or uh, in this design who is facing the foreign currency risk is it Qantas or is it GE let's look at GE it received 5% 5 5 US dollars pays 5% US dollars and and it pays 6.9 uh, AUD so the 5 cancels with the 5 so GE does not have any foreign currency exposure then we conclude that Qantas is the party that is exposed to the foreign currency risk. In uh, the final design, again, the financial institution is not uh, facing any financial, uh, any um, currency exposure. And also Qantas pay, receives 8% and pays 8% uh, in a so there is no exposure to the AUD and it will pay only 6.3 USD so if the financial institution does not uh, bear the exposure to the foreign currency risk and neither Qantas then it means that GE is the party that is exposed to the foreign currency risk and this is true because you can see that it receives 6.1 USD and pays 5% USD and then it pays 8% AUD so net GE is uh, is paying 6.9 but the payment is done is divided into two um, tranches one in which it receives an interest in US dollars and the other it pays in Australian dollars Now, how we can value a fix for fixed currency swap? Well, we can value this swap by assuming that the each currency is like a bond, a bond that pays coupons. And then we find the present value of these coupons uh, so uh, these bonds today and then based on uh, which uh, currency I'm receiving and which I'm paying we will try to find the difference and the difference will be uh, and convert them into one currency and the difference will be uh, uh, the difference will be the value of the uh, of the currency swap so let's assume that we are dealing with a Japanese entry uh, uh, that uh, a, bo uh, a currency swap in which one leg is for a Japanese uh, yen and the other is for the US dollar now the principles are 18 million US dollars and 1 billion 200 uh, yen the swap will last for three years and 
the uh, OIS for the Japanese currency is 1.5% and for the USD is 2.5%. Both are continuously compounded. Uh, the rates uh, are 3% is received in yen and 4% is paid in dollars. So we, uh, this means that we need to uh, evaluate uh, or value the, uh, the swap uh, for either the party who receives or, or pays. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind what is the current exchange rate uh, for yen compared to uh, or how much one dollar equals in yen or if you want to find the value of the swap in dollars then we have to find what each yen is equal to uh, uh, in terms of dollars now the third methodology to value the swap is in terms of taking uh, forward rates for the foreign uh, for the foreign exchange so there is nothing uh, unknown about the fixed cash flows sorry sorry the, the, the payments in the yen and the payments in the in the dollar uh, because the rates are fixed however I just want to show you one thing. The first cash flow in the swap will not take place today. It will take place after one year. Okay. Now, I cannot add the dollars to the yens because they are not the same currency. So I have to convert the yen into dollars. And then, then I can add and find what is the net cash flow. Now the question is, how can I convert the yen into dollars if the payment will take place after one year? Well, I don't uh, observe the, uh, I don't know what will be the spot rate, but at least I can estimate what will be the spot rate, uh, spot rate by looking at what will be the forward rate for the yen. So I will use the forward rate for the yen per, uh, uh, for, the, for, an, for the exchange rate of yen after one year to convert the yen into dollars. How can I get the forward rate? Now remember from chapter, from chapter 5 that F0 is equal to S0 times E to the power of R minus RF times T. We will assume, since we are trying to find the value of the swap in dollars, we have to find the forward uh, price for the yen. So RF will be the for, for the yen and R will be for the US dollar and T is, would depend on what is the period what you're looking at? Is it one year or two years or three years? So we got, we converted the yen into dollars. We find the current value, sorry, the net cash flow. Then we calculate the present value using the OIS for the dollars. Complete the process. We determine what is the forward rate for the second year because the exchange between yen and, and in the swap between the yen and dollars will take place after two years. Convert the yen into dollar, get the net cash flow, calculate the present value, and we will get this amount. Finally, when we are uh, um, at, when we reach the last payment. We have to take into account that the person who pays interest in dollars has to also pay the principal. And since he is receiving the interest for the yen, he has to receive the yen. 
So we receive the principal of the yen and uh, the uh, interest payments, you know, the coupon payments. If we consider it as a bond, but the interest payment in yen determine the forward rate for after three years. Convert using the forward rate the yen into dollars. Calculate the net cash flows, find the present value, and we will add now the present values. So we get 0 0.9629. <clears throat> Remember, whenever you write the value of a swap like this 0 0.9629 million, you have to remember to add million dollars with it. The other way to find the value of the swap is we consider each currency as a bond in which there are coupon payments for in, in each uh, currency and then in the last payment there will be uh, the face value and the last coupon payment. So here we find the value for for example the US dollar by discounting using the OIS, uh, the US OIS, and then we also find the present value of the yen bond, discounting using the yen OIS, we will get the value, uh, the present value of the uh, US currency is 10.4191 dollars, and the present value of the uh, uh, bond in yen is 1,252.01 now if we want to convert or find the value in terms of dollars uh, we convert the yen into dollars since we know that uh, one dollar is equal to 110 yens we take the opposite so to convert the yen into dollars and since we are receiving yen and paying in dollars so uh, yen after conversion into dollars the value of the bond in yen after conversion into dollars minus the present value of the dollar bond will give us the same value for uh, the swap the currency swap now other currency swaps we can uh, if the fixed for floating is equivalent for a fixed for fixed currency swap plus a fixed for floating interest rate swap and a floating for floating currency swap is also equivalent for equivalent to a fixed for fixed currency swap plus two floating interest rate swaps we can consider swaps as a convenient way to package forward contracts so we looked before at the case when we were dealing with the uh, valuation of a currency swap using the forward uh, exchange rates uh, it was similar to packaging a forward uh, exchange uh, for uh, a forward contract for foreign currencies in, into one contract now when we initiate the swap as in any other contract uh, derivative contract it has a value of zero but this does not mean that the the components of this package uh, are also equal to zero we might have some forward contracts will have a value of uh, positive value and others could have a negative value. Uh, since swaps are OTC uh, contracts mainly, and when they are cleared bilaterally, and there is no ca no central counterparty or uh, some other intermediaries, they involve uh, credit risk. because 
the transaction bet or the agreement between the two parties uh, is based on a a uh, an exchange that will take place multiple times in the future. So when the value of the swap is positive one 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 party and it is negative to the, another party, then there is a chance that the count the party with the negative who has a negative value in the swap will uh, default. So. Uh, to avoid this kind of risk and more and more now uh, participants in the market are asking to uh, uh, to collateralize these kinds of uh, transactions so when there is a value for one party to another party uh, the party who is losing has to post or provide the party who is gaining a collateral to at least reduce the credit risk associated with these types of contracts. Uh, we conclude our discussion in chapter seven by looking at credit default swaps. Now, this is an introduction to credit derivatives because here, in, 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 in these types of transactions, the exchange is not in terms of uh, a commodity to another commodity or a payment in another payment, no. The exchange here will take place only if an event happened or a default event happened. Now, <clears throat> let's assume that I issued a bond to uh, Ahmed. So I paid to Ahmed, uh, uh, I uh, borrowed from Ahmed a, a face value. And let's say the face value I borrowed a total of 100 million. And then I will pay to Ahmed coupon payments for let's say two years. Ahmed is worried about my credit quality. And he is concerned that I might uh, default or I might uh, go bankrupt and he will lose the face value and the coupon payments so he seeked for a protection and he went to Saleh who represents an investment bank and said I want to enter into a, a CDS to guarantee in case an, a, a, a default event happened I will receive back my face value So, uh, Ahmed and Salah agreed that, okay, Salah will provide this protection, but he has to pay on a regular basis, let's say every six months or every one year, depending on the agreement, the CDS spread. So, Ahmed will continue paying the CDS spread. If something happened and I defaulted, then Salah will pay back to Ahmed the face value that uh, he lent me. If nothing happened and the tenure of the swap has expired, then nothing has happened. So the CD, uh, Salah will get the CDS spread and do nothing. So this is basically the idea behind uh, CDS uh, or credit default swaps. Now, in the credit default swap, I am the reference entity. Okay, in, in Ahmed and Saleh, they don't have, uh, or Saleh at least, that doesn't have an agreement, a direct relationship with me. But his agreement with Ahmed is that if the reference entity defaulted or uh, had any problem uh, paying back his obligations, then Saleh will uh, pay the face value. 